Good morning. Welcome to our online service. We're glad we can be sort of together this morning. And we welcome you to worship with us from the coziness and warmth of your own homes. You can sing till your heart's content. We also invite you to use the comment section. It's a really nice way just to acknowledge who's here with each other this morning. And so if you want to just pop in there a quick hello or an encouragement, we invite you to, to use that.
and praise to you and even though we might feel as individuals right now we know that that we are a family we are a family under your love Mm -hmm. and that we are connected to each other right now and I pray that you help us to feel your spirit this morning as we are together as a unit as a body of Christ and and we thank you for all of the blessings in our lives this morning in your name we pray amen During this time, Christians around the world celebrate the season of Advent. Advent is an ancient word associated with the followers of Jesus Christ that literally means the coming or the arrival. This is a season of preparation. It is a time of preparation in mind, body, soul, and spirit for the coming of the arrival of Jesus Christ. In history, God's people anxiously waited the birth of Jesus because they believed he was their only hope for all things to be restored. Jeremiah 33, 14 to 16 says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I have promised them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line, and he will do what is just and right throughout the land. In that day, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety, and this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. Today, as we light the first candle of Advent in celebration of Jesus' birth, Jesus' arrival is the very thing that gives us hope that what is broken in our lives can be made new again. And this is not an idle way, but an active participation. pray together. God, we recognize our deep longing for a Savior. Help us to know that Jesus is the source of our hope. We wait for his arrival. Come, Lord. Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much to the Calmer family for sharing about uh, the hope that Jesus brings. And perhaps one of you listening today needs a little bit of extra hope today. And if you do and you would like some prayer, um, just throw a comment in or if it's somebody that you think needs prayer, um, just put their initials in and we will be sure to take the time to pray for them after the service today. I have a few other announcements today and we have lots going on for the holiday season. One of them is the Build a Backpack campaign for the mustard seed. So we are collecting new or gently used backpacks and we're stuffing them full of wonderful gifts for the clients of the mustard seed. So this could be bus tickets or coffee cards to Tim Hortons or McDonald's or some warm socks, um, just lots of things that you think that they might need. So if you can purchase some of those items, we would love that, and you can drop them off uh, here at the church during regular business hours or at my house on my porch or Pastor Keith's, and you can just message us for those addresses. Um, Also, I'm very excited about this one. On December 1st, which is this Tuesday, we are launching a live auction. 
So I know you're all probably like frantically trying to do your holiday shopping. Wait two more days and you can do all of your shopping and get some great items and all of the proceeds from this silent auction are going to the Asylum Seekers group. So we've got some great stuff from local businesses donated and you'll want to shop online. Um, and then next up, with schools closing for grades 7 to 12, we have a lot of Yazidi families in Calgary that are requiring laptops so they can actually do school from home. So if you happen to have a used one um, at home kicking around that you don't need anymore, please get in touch with Keith Schnell, and we would love to take that off your hands for you. Um, okay, and then Laura Lee, it's you. Morning. So all you families out here, out there in internet land. <laughs> it's November 29th. We're so excited. It's the first Sunday of Advent and our theme like the Calmer family was sharing with us this morning is hope. And I was thinking about hope this week and what is it that I hope for around Christmas time? Well I was making a list and one of the things on my list was having fun with my family. I'm actually hoping for a lot more snow. We love tobogganing, we love building snowmen, we love ice skating. I think I, I go ice skating like once or two times a year, and it's around Christmas time, and that says Christmas to me. And getting through all the Christmas Hallmark movies that I can get through, that's what I hope for. That's awesome. I love turning all the lights off in my living room and turning on the Christmas tree and having my cup of tea and watching these wonderful holiday movies, that says Christmas, and enjoying foods and smells like cinnamon. Cinnamon totally says Christmas to me. And music, I love singing Christmas carols. They are so much fun. I love singing with family and friends, and I'm hoping that we can this Christmas. Also, I'm hoping to bring some joy to my kids, right? I bought them Christmas presents, or I'm buying them, and I'm hoping that they love them. And in fact, oh, I have a little secret. Pastor Kevin, plug your ears. Plug your ears back there. I see you. <laughs> there, he plugged them. I, I can see. I bought him a Christmas sweater. It's a beautiful sweater. I want him to look shiny and new because in January, he is going to be speaking and preaching. So I want him to look really, really nice. So shh, don't tell him. I hope it fits. I hope it looks good. I hope he likes it. And maybe it's not really shiny, but whatever. It's great. So, shh. Okay, Pastor Kevin, you can undo your ears. Thank you. Awesome. So this Sunday, we are celebrating the hope that Jesus brings, and that's even better than all of those things that we've listed. It's better than my Hallmark movies. Ah! And it's better than all the presents under our Christmas trees. And you're going to learn more about it in your Advent kit this week. So speaking of your Advent kit, if your gift box is close by, why don't you grab it? I'm just going to grab mine. Perfect. And I want you to open it up. Here we go. And this week, you're going to pull out your Play-Doh. There is something in the activity kit this week that has to do with Play-Doh. So I want you to get it out read the instructions, read what you're supposed to do with it, and take a picture. When you take a picture, post it in the comments of this video because we want to see all the cool creations you guys come up with regarding hope together. Now, if you haven't gotten your kit, you're in luck. There's only eight kits left. We made 20, 12 of them are gone, and I am so excited to connect with those families and see what you guys do for Advent together but there's only eight left. So come by the church this week to pick one up. It's not too late. And if you can't, send me an email or a text, and I promise I'll get one to you this week. So Merry Christmas and Happy Hope Week. Good morning. I was way too into that. And I was totally like caught off guard that I should probably come up. Well, hello to everyone um, who's here and those who aren't. Um, welcome. I'm going to ask Oni to come forward, our office admin. Uh, some of you may know that she is engaged and excitedly about to get married. Woo! 
So Oni has been working with us for just over a year, and uh, she's been such an asset to all of us here at West Springs Church. There's things, I don't even really totally know everything that she does, so, um, <laughs> but I just know that things happen and things, things get accomplished, and I don't have to do them, which I'm always grateful for. Um, so Oni, as you head off to Nigeria next week, um, we just wanted to say thanks for all that you do and that we wish you all the best and a Merry Christmas because you're not going to be with us for Christmas season and we wanted to give you a small token of appreciation and a little gift for you and your family as, as you begin together. Can you, t I don't know if people will be able to hear you, but what is your fiance's name? It's up to you. And which city are you going to get married in? Well, we got a little sneak peek of the dress and some things, and it's going to be beautiful. And just before you go, we just wanted to bless you with, um, but also just to pray for you and for Ike. Dear God, we thank you for Oni and for the gift that she is to us. And God, we thank you for the gift that she and Ike are to each other. And God, though they've been apart, and this wedding has been delayed um, due to this pandemic, God, we thank you that you have made a way for them to move forward. And so as they plan and as they think ahead, as they think about what all that the future entails, God, we just ask that their um, marriage would experience your blessing, that their planning, their last-minute things would come together smoothly. And God, we pray for safety. We pray for physical safety. We pray for Oni's health as she travels between two continents. We pray for her family as they join her. And so, God, we know that you go before us, and we know that you have already begun to do some great work in Oni and in Ike. And so, God, we just ask that you would multiply what it is that you have started in them. In your name, amen. Blessings. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here with you, and I hope you are... And I'm, I'm hoping that we get lots of um, excited remarks in our Facebook Live as we say congratulations to Oni and to Ike um, for their upcoming um, nuptials. I remember doing actually something very similar in traveling to Nigeria for a wedding, and it was much easier <laughs> back then without COVID, etc. cetera. So um, all the best to you and your family. We're in the middle of the Minor Prophets, and this morning we're going to be looking at Zephaniah and Zechariah. These books speak to the people of Israel at two very different times in their history. Zephaniah speaks to the people after they have endured the horrific reign of two kings who led the nations towards an allegiance with Assyria, thereby leading the people to let go of their allegiance to God. They put their trust in this foreign nation to the extent that they embraced their idols and their methods of worship. This action went directly against the covenant relationship that Israel had established with God, and it is because of this that Zephaniah announces that their life apart from God would lead them towards choices as a nation that would have grave consequences. Zechariah speaks at the other end of the spectrum. His voice is one that comes after they have already experienced the consequences of their actions. And now that they have moved from exile and are making their way back to their hometowns, their familiar spaces and places and ways of worship, they're being asked to make a decision. The prophet invites them not just to return to Jerusalem, to this place that they have loved and lost, 
but he calls them also to return to this deep and growing relationship with God. To be a people who are formed by holiness, a people who pursue righteousness as a way of being. Two different prophets, two different times in history, yet somehow they hold something in common. The people are reminded, both as they are being beckoned to stay in relationship with God, and later invited to return to relationship with God, that as, this, as they make this move towards a love that looks like faithfulness, or a faithfulness that looks like love, a love of God that is inspired, um, that is to inspire us to love others, that is going to require more than willpower. In order for them to do do this, it's going to require far more than motivation, far more than guilt or even acknowledgement of simply doing something wrong. You see, they had walked this road back and forth over and over and over again throughout their history as a people. They had this push and pull relationship with God that always seemed to ebb and flow depending on leader, success, or disappointment. And regardless of their momentary rise to be a people of worship, they always seem to find themselves somehow moving in the opposite direction of where God was leading them. And so the words of the prophets that had gone before, the words of kings and leaders that had spoken before, the miracles they had experienced before, none of it had the capacity to lead them towards any type of consistency depth or persistence when it came to this idea of love that looks like faithfulness. They were neither consistent with how they treated one another or consistent in how they walked humbly with their God. And so both Zephaniah and Zechariah announced boldly that a return to God, that a return to holiness, that a return to love that is inspired by God and leads them to love others a love that leads to the transformation of those things that surround them, that it requires something far more lasting, far more reliable, and far more sustainable than their will, than their desire, than their mind over matter, than their personal push to goodness. The prophets announced that if this relationship with God is going to be a catalyst for internal and external change, if it's going to be something that leads to actual transformation that goes beyond a single generation, a single family, or a single nation, if it's going to have the capacity to be life-changing and world-changing, then they need something far greater than self-determination. They require a savior. They require the Christ, the Messiah. They're going to need a king. Now, when the people hear that this word king, they would have immediately agreed. After all, a king to them was exactly how we envision a king or a strong leader today. They would have expected that this promised king would be someone who could handle their enemies. He would organize their armies and take down those who intended to harass, belittle, or undermine them. He would be powerful and strong, courageous, and offer justice to those who lived under his rule, allowing the like-minded to have a voice and all others to be silenced. One author states it like this. He says, kings in the Near East were looked upon as superhuman, as more than mere mortals, since they accomplished grand projects that it seemed that no human could carry out on their own. This is what they imagined the kingship to be all about, the accomplishment and the establishment of a nation. And the people would have agreed wholeheartedly that this is what they had been missing all along. This is the kind of king that they longed for. This is the kind of king that they needed. Yet two prophets, Zephaniah and Zechariah, although decades apart in their ministries, are not announcing their need for yet another human king. They're not announcing their need for another political overhaul. Instead, their words intertwined with the heart of God declare to the masses that the only king that they needed was the king they already had. Zephaniah announces, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment 
and will disperse the armies of your enemies. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over, and you will never again fear disaster, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fear. He will rejoice over you with joyful song. The words are striking. Yet the temptation would be then and now to see the words of the prophet as nothing more than a figurative ideal. To only see this as a figurative announcement and miss out on the literal promise. On the promise that God would not only be their king and live among them as a spiritual platitude, but that God would live among them and that this would be the start of the story of the kingdom of God, that this would be a part of their story intersecting with God's plan. Decades later, this promise is repeated in Zechariah as he says, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet humble. The king would come to them. This would be the promise. They would hold on to for generations. This would be the promise they would hold on to for centuries, that this king would be a political maverick, a geography shaper, a religious freedom enforcer, a general who would produce such fear and order that peace was inevitable, that he would come and do not just what he promised, but that he would do all that they imagined. And so centuries later, when what we title as the Christmas story and the Easter story become the story, so many people missed these moments as the revelation of the king. Rather than grandeur, he was born in a stable, surrounded by animals instead of dignitaries. And instead of a palace, he was raised in what many consider to be this unwanted postal code among unwanted real estate. Even as an adult, people wondered what good can come from Nazareth. His influence was not about reshaping foreign policy or national defense. Rather, he influenced fishermen and zealots, tax collectors, and his brothers. He spent time with the sick and the broken and the tired. He could be found having conversations with a foreign and despised woman at a well, eating with tax collectors, those who were considered traitors, having his clothes touched by the unclean, walking and picking grain haphazardly on the Sabbath, telling the blind they can see, the adulteress that she is forgiven, and the lame that they can walk again. And in the midst of it all, there is no mention of overthrowing kingdoms. There's no mention of the destruction of Rome. No mention of armies traipsing through the desert in an effort to avenge. No mention of backroom political deals. No mention of Israeli prosperity in exchange for their enemies' despondency. And so there were no signs that this was going to be as big or revolutionary. There was no sign that this was going to be a global movement of change. There was nothing about him that should have spread outside of Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. There was nothing about this story that should have gone out into the world. Nothing about him should have spanned for century after century. Nothing that should be thousands of years old. Nothing that should be talked about except as something obscure in a history book. Yet for those of us who know him, for those of us who have met him, for those of us who know the king, we see that he came to offer something that looked nothing like what they imagined, nothing like what we would imagine today. Jesus as king is the great paradox. Zechariah declared that the paradoxical king as one who was victorious and righteous yet humble. A king who didn't need the trappings of royalty to address his subjects, in fact, he gave up every bit of royalty to walk among us, crownless, titleless, and missing the grandeur of status. A king who came not to promote the destruction of a nation, the elevation of one over the other, but a king who came to promote peace. A king who came not just for his nation, not just for his kinsmen, not just for his people, but a king who came for the nations, a king who came 
for the world. And as Jesus carried the cross, as our sins were laid upon him, on the day of his crucifixion, he looked nothing like a king. And it appeared on that day that yet another almost Messiah had come and gone. Another story of a man we thought could have been great comes to this shocking close as he declares, it is finished. This is not what anyone would have imagined when they thought about a king, a man dying for what seemed to be a nonsensical cause, labeled as a criminal. And yet, by few, a king. So why today do we declare that Jesus is indeed the King of Kings. The reason he carries such a title has little to do with simply his death or his ability to be a role model or his leadership of the 12 disciples. His title is not simply about this new moral code or because the sick were healed. Rather, his title as king centers not on another human seeking perfection, majesty, or a following. Rather, when we encounter Jesus, we are no longer speaking of the establishment of a human kingdom, but the one who is the beginning and the end. God himself coming to be like us, to walk among us, to experience our sorrow, to witness our sickness, to see us at our best and at our lowest, to feel the weight of the entanglement of our temptation and our sin, to experience even our death and then to conquer it all when he rose from the dead. The resurrection, this is what makes him worthy of worship. This is what makes him worthy of praise. This is what makes him worthy to be called our king. That not even death had power to consume him. And as a result, not even death has power to consume us. The story of Jesus is the story of a savior, one who came to rescue us. But the story doesn't end there. And it is also the story of Jesus as King of Kings. The one who came to conquer those things that wanted to conquer us. The one who even now sits at the right hand of the Father, praying on our behalf, defending us from the enemy who always wanted to tear us from new life. Jesus, our King, is the one who lives among us. He's the one establishing a reign of peace in the midst of our terror. The one who promises deliverance in the midst of our bondage. The one who offers just in the midst of all that is unjust around us. And while it appears even now that when we look all around us that it seems that God cannot be king, we like Israel are asked to live in the certain promise that he alone has the authority to make all things new. And this is what he has stayed started with the resurrection and what he has promised to fulfill with his second coming and that which the church has been empowered to participate in as we are filled with the Spirit. His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, that is what the church is all about. Yet in some ways, I think the church is still waiting for Jesus, the King, to come and smite our enemies. We long for those who practice their faith differently to disappear, or at least not to gain any new ground. We want them to be, we want atheism to be swallowed up by religion. We want to be the social stronghold and the moral compass of the world. We imagine that if Jesus is king, then we should win and that we should be the powerful. And we get caught up in the exact same issues that that Israel did so many years ago. And we begin to imagine that God is all about politics. That he's all about geography and national defense. And we miss out on the point. The resurrection was not about national pride. It was not about patriotism. It was not about policy. It was not about freedom from, of religion in the public square. Rather, the resurrection and the subsequent ascension was about an individual and collective move towards a way of being in which God's way permeates our ways. Where God's thoughts become our thoughts and his life begets our fullness of life. 
A fullness that leads to the transformation of self and the transformation of structures and systems. A transformation of ways of being. A transformation that leads to violence subsiding, to poverty collapsing, to equality and equity rising. Darkness transitioning to light. A transformation that begins with the voice and the words of the king, but is executed by the empowered, spirit-led people of God called the church. One of the truths we often leave behind is that sin is already defeated, that darkness is already conquered, that death has already lost its sting. And when God manifests himself in the supernatural, and while God manifests himself in the supernatural, he most often manifests himself through you and I. And so while Jesus is king, it is his subjects who are empowered by his words and his spirit and his message that bring about a world that looks like his kingdom. And so as Christ followers, our mantra remains, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But they cannot be simple words. They must translate into a deep and meaningful action. Actions that only arise when we look like those spoken of in the book of Zechariah and Zephaniah and choose to lean deeply into the one who empowers us to, to a love that looks like faithfulness and a faithfulness that looks like love. It is here that we have the capacity to announce that money and power, greed and fear, dominance, control, addictions, comparison, pleasure, and the words of others cannot conquer us. Nor do we want them to conquer others. Because our king died and our king rose from the dead. Our king lives among us and in fact lives within us so that we no longer need to give allegiance to those things that want to overpower us, entangle us, or consume us. These are the very things that Christ our king died and came to life again to conquer. There is one king we need and it's the one king we have always had. The only one whose words and whose presence has the power to establish a new kingdom one person at a time, one church at a time, one community at a time, one city at a time, one nation at a time. But it begins with you and I announcing that we are surrendered to King Jesus. He is our king and we are his subjects. All words that can sound so foreign, all words that can be so challenging to live out in the everyday. Yet here is the invitation that our hearts would be like his, that our actions would follow his own, that our thoughts and values would align with his, that our possessions, professions, and passions are gifts that we would use to his glory. Are the gifts we use to see the kingdom of God realized right here, right now, right where we are? And so as we enter Advent, the season of waiting for what is promised, may we take a moment to ask ourselves, who is our king? And what will it take for our lives to be centered and formed by the resurrected king of kings, Jesus? Elizabeth Actmeyer says this. She says, this is the kind of Messiah we worship, one who dies on the cross and comes back to life. And he tells us that if we would be his disciples, we too must take up a cross and follow him. We too must be willing to die to ourselves, to our own desires and purposes, in order that God may bring us to life. As he works his will within us, a suffering, paradoxical Messiah is the king of our lives, one giving himself up totally to the Father's will. And those who claim to be his followers are to have no lesser a commitment. I'll ask the worship team to come back up. This is our calling, to be the ones who live, announce, remind, exclaim, and rejoice because Jesus is our eternal king who suffered for us, who died for us, who rose for us, and who lives for us today. 
so that we can experience and share the good news of the kingdom of God. So we can both experience and offer a love that looks like faithfulness to our neighbors, to our families and friends, to our coworkers, to our classmates, to a world that is invited into the possibility of transformation because the king lives among us.
As we go into the week, I think in Advent, it's so fitting to remember that Jesus is our hope. But then to take it one step further and remember that because he is our hope, we are inspired and invited to offer hope to those around us. So my prayers for you this week is that as we recognize and as we come to live out this reality that Jesus is our king, the king that lives among us, that we would be the people who live among our friends and neighbors, that live among our classmates and our coworkers as ones who understand who the king is. Have a blessed week. Fun. It's a fun one.